Queen's solid commitment. Thank you again for your words. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General, for your kind words and uh, your welcome, um, Vice President and uh, Minister of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of the Government of Spain, Ambassadors, uh, members of the national delegations, members of the Secretariat, ladies and gentlemen. Well, good morning and uh, to everyone. Bonjour. Uh, it is indeed a, a great pleasure. And, and an honor to be with you all today at the Chateau de la Mouette uh, on what is actually my first visit to this institution as head of state. Uh, it is not, however, my first uh, time here because uh, as um, heir to the throne, Prince of Asturias, I had the opportunity to come uh, in 2007 uh, with the Secretary Angel Gurria and had the, also the opportunity to meet with the Council I do have wonderful memories of that. Uh, after uh, mm, taking into consideration that I was then fulfilling a kind of a long-held uh, dream, uh, as I said then, uh, by visiting this organization, because um, it helped me learn about its work more closely and, and in greater depth. But obviously, I recently, had, had, having been a student a graduate student, uh, I did do a lot of work on the OECD, and so that it did give me a very close <laughs> perspective to make sure what I was studying was the right stuff. <laughs> um, actually, I have a gra fellow uh, graduate student with us uh, ar around here, uh, um, so that that also uh, gives me a great pleasure to see a classmate of mine here in, at the OECD. At the end of uh, last year, um, I visited the IMF in Washington, where I met with the managing director. Just before that, in October, I went to the European Central Bank in, in Frankfurt to meet with its president and other members of the executive board. In both cases, I was uh, naturally well briefed about the general economic outlook, together with the many measures and initiatives taken in the context of enormous complexity uh, at the international level. And this visit here in Paris uh, follows suit and is also an example, may I say, of Spain's uh, solid commitment, and I thank again your, your words, uh, to multilateralism and to the fundamental objectives of the OECD. So thank you again for uh, having me and, and for giving me this uh, excellent opportunity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, back to my visit in 2007. Uh, the scene may seem familiar to this one, but uh, the actors and the script have changed a great deal, becoming so much more complex, to say the least. At that time, uh, we did or could not know uh, that we would have to face one huge financial crisis, a pandemic, uh, a war, a very serious and gruesome war in Europe, a high inflation situation, an energy crisis, dot, 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 all in a somewhat messy reshaping once again of the world order. We knew challenge, change was happening fast, but not how fast, how deep and what kind of grave and unexpected hurdles we would have to face. We were also not aware of how far we would be in the midst of several deep transitions, uh, energy transition, digital transition, uh, and another as important, but uh, maybe uh, less referred to, a demographic transition. Throughout all these unexpected events, we highly appreciate the enormous work that the OECD performs and its tremendous practical relevance, not only for its members, its member countries, but also for the world at large. Particularly, I would like to refer to the OECD's reaction as an institution and all of us as members, member <coughs> countries to the pandemic. In no time, you suggested the same answers for all our countries based primarily on the protection of workers and the productive framework. Equally unanimous was the way you handled the exit, the exit from the pandemic through the recovery process 
uh, indeed the aim of building back better was a shared one, and across our countries we put it to work. It soon emerged that building back better clearly meant a strong, green, digital and inclusive growth. The next important episode in these complex times was Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Once more, the OECD's answer was swift and unequivocal, not only condemning the aggression, but isolating Russia from all activities to the, of the OECD, and declaring Ukraine prospective member for accession when the time comes, establishing a new office in Kyiv, and most importantly, committing the OECD to collaborate firsthand in the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine when the moment arrives. As we spoke uh, earlier, uh, and owing to your recent visit uh, to Kyiv, uh, uh, recovery is actually happening today, uh, even during in the midst of the war. In this troubled period, the OECD has shown to be a very dynamic organization it answers speedily to all the unexpected challenges that have occurred, leading to the growing trust that our member countries have in the organization as a pathfinder and as a central piece of global governance. Now the situation continues to be complex. In front of the outburst of inflation, the OECD signals that very targeted fiscal stimuli should be used to protect the more exposed segments in our societies. Vis-a-vis -vis the energy crisis, it is const constantly working along with the International Energy Agency to prepare the world for the next w winter. And along with the WTO, it is now concerned about how to avoid a new wave of protectionism and defend open trade when globalization has so has shown, if, indeed, several shortcomings. This leads me to another important issue of our times. The war in Ukraine has unveiled a new geopolitical landscape on many grounds. Democracy, individual liberties, and human rights are, no question, under severe threat. Today, in addressing this, I would like to remember the words of President J.F. Kennedy when he suggested the creation of the Development Center to, of the OECD and addressed the question of development in his speech at the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa in May 1961. I quote, For our historic task in this embattled age is not merely to defend freedom. It is to extend its writ and strengthen its covenant to peoples of different country, cultures and creeds and colors whose policy or economic system may differ from ours, but whose desire to be free is no less fervent than our, our own." Unquote. This outgoing attitude, this drive to extend freedom to people whose policy or economic systems may differ from ours, not only remains, but we all should also aim to reinforce it. It truly involves a renewed effort to build bridges with all emerging and developing countries. The pandemic, the war of aggression of Russia on Ukraine and its consequences in terms of inflation, disruption and bottlenecks in the supply chains, among others, have also revealed a new geopolitical scenario of competition among differing political systems in vast regions of Africa, Latin America and Indo-Pacific. In the race to build alliances and partnerships, the role of the OECD Development Center that uh, just last year uh, celebrated uh, its 60th anniversary, congratulations, by the way, uh, as a bridge builder becomes ever more relevant. In particular, let me highlight your efforts to set up a partnership with Africa. It is noteworthy that you have labeled them as partnerships, not as a program. By doing so, you actually send out several important messages, like aiming, above all, to build the relationships of mutual trust with Africa. As I was able to point out on my recent state visit to Angola, 
that with Africa it is time to co-create, to deal with each other on equal footing, to work looking openly for mutual benefits and common interests. In this sense, you can count on Spain as a partner with a strong will to help its neighbors, as shown with our initiative on the establishment of the African Investment Observatory, to cope with the rapid demographic growth that they are experiencing and that should be matched by an even great bigger sustainable economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, the OECD works steadfastly to give them give the term development the importance it deserves, which is essential if this organization is to remain a pathfinder in the international governance system. However, what is even more important is that the OECD, while dealing with all these important issues, is being able at the same time to tackle the transitions of our times, the energy transition, the digital transition. From the outside, we one can observe a great deal of activity in the area of climate change and biodiversity at the OECD. I would like to take the opportunity to salute the IPAC, the International Program for Action on Climate. Through regular monitoring, policy evaluation and feedback on results and best practices, IPAC is helping countries strengthen and coordinate their climate action. Most importantly, we are aware of the great success that the launch of the Inclusive Forum for Carbon Mitigation Approaches meant, with more than 100 countries joining the initiative on reporting about their efforts in this area and the likely impact that they will have for the decarbonization of the world at large. With all the efforts put into horizontal programs, the OECD is becoming an important engine for the green transition worldwide. Similarly, the work done by the OECD in the field of digitalization and artificial intelligence is notable. I had, as you mentioned, the opportunity of meeting with many members and executives in charge of this area in the Canary Islands last December for the Digital Economy Ministerial Meeting. And I know of the work that through the years this organization is undertaking in, the, in such a vital area. Your contributions are crucial for the future of the transition and now the new avenues have opened up with the work on rights in the digital era and on the setting up of the Global Forum on Technology that is being sponsored by the US, United Kingdom and Spain. Spain, like other member states, greatly benefits from the thorough work of the OECD in all areas mentioned so far all the ministries in the government, even many regional and local authorities collaborate with the OECD and benefit from its work. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear ambassadors, we are generally and widely proud of a, our EU membership, proud of its drive to maintain an open autonomous strategy, as of its will to maintain and nurture our strong transatlantic ties which we work to enhance and even like to, to look at with a wider perspective. This is both proof and consequence of our deep belief in democracy and human rights. So we are also proud of defending the common <coughs> values they carry, proud of being a welcoming and friendly country to all those who want to enjoy our modern infrastructures, our historical heritage, modern communications, transport systems, our climate, and our quality of life. All of this is a true blessing, but it also owes to hard work and certainly comes with responsibilities we do not elude towards our friends and allies and to the international community. To address those responsibilities effectively while defending our legitimate ambitions and to expect other nations to do the same in this growingly complex, complex uncertain and interdependent world, we strongly believe that the best way is to work constructively through and with multilateral institutions. Therefore, you cannot be surprised to hear from me today as head of state that Spain is deeply proud to be an active member of the OECD, always committed to better policies for better lives. 
I wish you all every success in this undertaking, and thank you all so much for your attention.